Okay, we're going to take a look at the history of Avalon Hill's Gettysburg Games and the 125th anniversary edition in particular. So as a quick recap, the first Avalon Hill version was 1958 called Just Gettysburg and it was a square grid game. Soon after, a few years later I think, they released a hexagon grid version. Very similar artwork. They then abandoned that title and reworked Gettysburg again, changing the artwork slightly on the outside. Very hard to tell them apart, by the way. And uh, they went back to the square grid version. And this version lasted, was the standard version for quite a long time, lasting, I think, almost 11 years. Then in 1977, they totally reworked the Gettysburg game, giving it new artwork and putting three versions of the game in one box. And this was their standard version for many years. Now, 11 years later, Avalon Hill decided to rework the title again, and they called it the 125th Anniversary Edition, because it had been 125 years since the battle. And they issued it in this rather large box format, actually physically the same size as the others, but very thin. And they issued this game in two different formats, which I always thought was kind of odd. I don't know why they did that, because um, they issued it in this Smithsonian edition. They called this whole series the Smithsonian edition uh, of games, and um, the cover artwork is slightly different. You can see this one is kind of a portrait stance. The Smithsonian edition, all they did was change the, turn the box 90 degrees and put the Smithsonian logo on it. But the two games, um, I understand, are exactly the same. Only the packaging was different. It'd be interesting to find out why they um, went to two different packaging, because that can get quite expensive, um, especially when you're offering the same game. I don't know if this game was sold exclusively at the Smithsonian Institution, or whether it was meant to be um, sold in stores. I'm not sure. But this is the edition I have, the 125th edition, and we're going to look very carefully at this one compared to other versions. Okay, one thing we have to keep in mind in examining this game is that it is an introductory game in every sense of the word. Um, it's not a serious simulation of the Battle of Gettysburg. For one, Avalon Hill went back to the division scale that they'd used back in their old 58 design. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Confederates are only going to have nine infantry counters, because that's what the size of the Confederate Army was, nine divisions. The Union has 19 divisions, although they were smaller. So I was just looking at some of the data here, and it's kind of interesting to see what Avalon Hill did. In the 64 edition, the Confederate had nine divisions, and this 88 edition, they also have nine. That didn't change. In the original 64-58 edition, they had six artillery battalions. In the new one, they have seven. They added uh, Beckham's horse artillery to the mix. That's the only new counter. They also had seven cavalry brigades, and in the new edition, they had seven cavalry brigades. Now, for the Union, they did quite something uh, quite different, which is a little odd. The Union had 19 divisions at Gettysburg, and in both versions, 58 and 1998, they have 19 divisions. And in the cavalry, they had eight cavalry brigades, and the new edition, they had eight cavalry brigades. But for some reason, in the 58 edition, the Union had five artillery battalions, all the volunteer artillery, and in the new edition, they had 14. So they added 14 new counters to the 88 edition, while adding only one counter for the Confederates. Now that's very curious. Now I've been just looking at the factors here. Um, the old game had 52 factors for the Confederate and uh, the Union had 70. In the new version, the Confederates have 63 factors and the Union have 79. Okay, I don't want this to get too complicated, but I'm trying to show you what I mean here about the order of battle. Now this is the order of battle from the original 58 version. For example, the 6th Corps, Union, composed of three divisions, Wright, Howe, and Newton. There were three factors each. So the 6th Corps was nine factors. And the 
Union First Corps, Wadsworth, Robinson, and Rowley, there's also nine factors. Now this is completely wrong because we know the Sixth Corps was huge. It was much larger than the First Corps. So the order of battle for the 58 version was not correct at the Corps level nor at the Division level. It was really an abstract of the battle. The Confederate um, order of battle is, also has some anomalies. For example, we know that the smallest division in the army was Pickett, and he's given a 3 2. And um, Hood and McClaws are also 3 2s. So there's some aberrations there. Also, one of the largest divisions at the battle for the Confederates was Rhodes Division. It's a 4 2, yet it's the same size as a Heath and Pender and the other divisions. So there were anomalies in the original order of battle. Um, that were not correct. I might point out though that the ratio of the armies, Union to Confederate, was correct. It was a ratio of approximately 1.3 to 1 and that's about what um, the ratio was historically. Um, Lee was not outnumbered 2 to 1 at Gettysburg. The armies were very evenly matched. And I'm glad to say that in the reworked version here of uh, Gettysburg 88 uh, there are little wee slight anomalies in the order of battle but Overall, they got it uh, rather correct. When you compare the two orders of battle, they're pretty good. Um, not perfect, but pretty good. Okay, the strange thing with the order of battle for the Union in this game are the addition of the core artillery for the Union. So they get seven new artillery counters. That's the core artillery. The Union had seven cores at Gettysburg. That's why seven new uh, counters for core artillery. But for the Confederates, they did not add the divisional artillery. Um, the only unit they added was Beckham's horse artillery. So the Union got seven new counters, the Confederates got one. Now doing the math on the factors here, adding them all up and getting the ratios, you get a ratio in the new game of 1.25 to 1, which is slightly different than the original one, 1.346 to 1. But overall, the order of battle for the army level in the, this introductory game is correct. So um, in the broad brush strokes of the battle, the order of battle is acceptable. It's not perfect. It's a little curious. Um, I wonder why the Confederates didn't get their divisional artillery. It might have added a heck of a lot more counters. Well, nine more counters. So um, maybe in playtesting they decided that was just too many counters. I'm not sure what the limitation was. Just that the order of battle is a little curious in this game, but it's still um, it's got nothing to do with the game being fun to play. This is a really fun game to play. It can be played in a couple of hours and is very simple. But there's some other anomalies that I'd like to show you and um, let's take a look. Okay, before we look at particulars, let's make a comment on the rules. Um, an introductory game it is, and I mean introductory. The rules are a single double-sided sheet. That's it. So you're talking a simple game. Now, one thing they did was include this really neat little battle manual. And this is, you can see it's, you know, for people just new to the hobby. You got this nice little article on the Gettysburg campaign, photographs, uh, charts, things like that. It's, it's really nicely done. And in that manual are examples of play, how to play the game, and there are some optional rules, and you've got the various scenarios in here too. And this is where the game gets a little um, iffy. Uh, being a battle manual with the historical information and the scenarios, you have to go fishing around a bit to find uh, what you want. It's not all in one place, but it, it was a nice. It's a nice little manual and. Uh, it just confirms the fact that it is an introductory game. It's, it tries to be all things and kind of doesn't quite succeed uh, at, uh, at what it wants to be. But um, that's the rules and battle manual to the game. Okay, the rules themselves. Well, we've got the standard stuff we've become used to in uh, hexagon grid games. The zones of control all around, no facing at all. Um, standard information, combat and uh, the movement. They are double-sided counters. You flip to the other side to show when a unit has been damaged. And um, how to have combat. Well, it's 
your basic hex grid stuff. When a unit is adjacent to another one, they have combat. Now, I'm going to show you how the combat system works, and this is where the game really becomes simplified and, uh, I hate to say distorts history, but you can get some very curious results. Let me show you how that works. Okay, when we look at combat, we have to keep in mind the time scale, which is another thing they changed. The turns are not hourly. They actually represent two hours. So this is a very simple game in that the July 1st is only seven turns, two hours each, and you have a night turn in between each day. So keep that in mind when we look at the combat. Each turn represents two hours. Okay, here's that classic setup we've seen many, many times before. Good old Devon and Gamble cavalry brigades deployed north and west of the town of Gettysburg, and usually the Confederates off board getting ready to come down the Chambersburg Pike. And the sequence of plays a little odd for turn one. The Confederates move first on turn one, but since they don't have any units on the board, they don't move first. The Union actually moves and they can go into a blocking position. So what we often see is Devon and Gamble coming up here, trying to slow down Heath's division, as we've seen in many, many games before. The trouble is, at the division level, the game is so simple that you can get some very wide um, variations of luck. And that's kind of where the system falls down. Let's take a closer look. Okay, the combat is very simple. And let's see how that works. When you have a combat, all you do is add your combat factors, Heath, 5, and he will roll one die. A 10-sided die, I might point out, and a 0 in this game represents a 10, not a 0. And Gamble would roll one die, but he gets one more because he's in woods. So 2 plus his die roll. So let's do a typical attack. Heath composed of four infantry brigades attacking Gamble, a single cavalry brigade. Now let's see a typical result. And I'm going to roll a pure dice here, not alter anything, and just see what we get. Okay, the Confederates roll a six, and Gamble rolls a one. So his net total is three, and Heath's is eleven. Eleven exceeds three by seven which, according to the rules, if you lose six or more, Gamble would lose two steps, so he would be destroyed. Um, a reasonable result, considering if Gamble had tried to contest the whole advance of Heath, and Heath would be able to advance into the square. Now, here's where the game can get a little wonky in its results. Let's redo that attack again with different die roll results. Okay, let's do that same attack. But let's say that Devin had got, or Gamble had got, extremely lucky and rolled a 10. And let's say Heath had got extremely unlucky and rolled a 1. So the results now would be 10 plus 2, 12. Heath, 6, which means the Union exceeds the Confederate roll by 6, which means the Confederate loses two steps, which means Heath, one step, Heath destroyed. Now that's where the game gets a little wonky. It just was not possible that a cavalry brigade under a gamble could destroy an entire Confederate division. So that's one thing you have to understand about this game. The luck can be um, very, very decisive. It can go all over the place. Now. I'll be attending WBC this summer, and I'd be interested to watch some of the veteran players, the ones who win the tournaments, how they play these games. Now, it's a very luck-dependent game, but of course skill does come into it. There are long-range artillery rules, and I'm sure that that's a situation that no veteran player will put himself in, having Heath attack, gamble, and just leave it up to the dice. That would be rather silly. Because you do have other units. You've got artillery units that can add in their fire factors, so in this case, uh, for example, Heath could add Pegram in, 5 plus 2, 7, and then he'd roll a die, and Gamble would also roll a die and compare. So you can lessen um, the luck factor by judicious moving of your units. But one has to be aware that this is a very luck-dependent game. 
it's a good introductory game for showing, um, bringing somebody new into the hobby, maybe teaching your son or your daughter, maybe um, having a game with your wife or girlfriend. It's, it is introductory level, and they'll get something out of it. And I think that's why this game has endured so well. Um, it's introductory level, and it was also the last game, uh, Gettysburg, that Avalon Hill ever produced. So I think that's why it has endured uh, so long over the years. Okay, I didn't say much about the map. It's very small. It's only two sections. It is mounted, and it's very nice looking. The interpretation of the train is, is fair, although at this level, division level, and these huge hexes, um, there are some anomalies. Like McPherson's Woods and McPherson's Ridge are just one big clump here, and uh, the town is just one big clump. The Unfinished Railroad is kind of maybe overemphasized. Um, too bad we don't have a collaborative effort with Rick Barber, who's our resident expert on Gettysburg maps. Um, interesting to get Rick's comments on this map. I think he's said that this, you know, it's, it's, it's functional. Again, we have to remember what this is. It's an introductory game. We've got little round top, big round top, that kind of thing. The hills don't do much in this game. Not much at all. They don't affect combat hardly at all. Only when you get this wooded hills, like little round top, big round top, with the little stones on them, do they make any big difference. Forest also makes a difference. You get a favorable defensive modifier, which sometimes leads to a historical placement of troops. Every game I've ever heard of, practically, always seems to assume that when you're in woods, all of a sudden you're doubled, or you get a huge advantage. Um, I don't know if those are the lessons we want to learn from this, but um, if you're going to design a division level game on Gettysburg, one thing that must be correct is your order of appearance. And with this game being two hours a turn, the order of appearance is extremely important. And the way the roads and um, column movement work. I'm going to show that and show you why this game kind of falls down in that respect. Let's see why the column rules aren't quite right. Okay, there are no rules for units coming in in column behind each other. So for example, if the Chambersburg Pike was unopposed by Devon and Gamble, Heath could move a huge distance because each hex is a half moving point. So with Heath moving five, he can move ten squares down this road. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, ten. He can be way down here. So road movement is huge in this game. You can move very far. And um, there's no rules for Pegram, for example. Heath and Pegram come on at the same time. There's no rules for Pegram paying any more to come in over Heath. Now again, these are division units. Five brigades march, marching along this road is going to stretch out for quite a distance. There are no rules to cover that. Again, it's an introductory game. So you just put the men on, and away you go. Heath can move ten if he wants, so can Pegram. So um, that's an anomaly of the system. The units can move pretty far, and there's no rules for uh, being in calm. Well, there's one in the sense that you're not allowed to go uh, moving column against or adjacent to an enemy unit. That's why the position of De Devon and Gamble are so important in the opening phases. They've got to slow down Heath's movement. They sometimes have to do that at the expense of being destroyed. And there's just no retreat for combat rules for cavalry. Um, and as I pointed out, the dice can completely undermine your game depending on what you roll. Okay, the order of appearance for the Union Army isn't bad. It seems to be pretty well correct. But I have a bit of an axe to grind with the arrival of two Confederate divisions in this game. And again, I'm keeping in mind that this is meant to be a simple game. But a simple game doesn't mean that um, you've just got license to get everything wrong. You can still get things right with a simple game. Now, one of the controversies of Gettysburg is the arrival of Anderson's division on the first day. Now, for those of you who have read about the battle, you might find that mention of Anderson's division is strangely absent from a lot of accounts. 
And I delved into this to try to read more about it and find out why. Well, we know that Anderson's division did arrive on July 1st in the vicinity of the battlefield by mid-afternoon. That's not in question. What is in question is why Anderson was not used in the battle at all. It was totally not engaged. And many authors have just not got into that. And the reason appears to be that General Lee just didn't want it to get engaged. He didn't want to bring on an engagement on July 1st. And Anderson's division, though it was available in the vicinity, was not engaged on July 1st. So the designer has caught between a rock and a hard place here. Does he bring Anderson in on the historical time he did arrive? Now in this game it's turn 5, which is 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. That would be about right. But the movement is so liberal in this game that if the Chambersburg Pike is unopposed, Anderson could be, what, 10 hexes down this road? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He could be well past Gettysburg by um, 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we'd be available from 4 p.m. till 8 p.m. nightfall for total combat on the first day. So, mm, that's an iffy one. Um, personally, I would have had Anderson perhaps um, arrive a little later, but if you want to explore historical what-ifs, Anderson was there, so I can't really slight the designer for choosing Anderson coming in early or at that time. Where it gets a lot more problematical is the arrival of Johnson's division, which in this game arrives on turn 6, which is 4 to 6 p.m., and this is definitely wrong. This just is not right. And in the game, that can be a deal breaker. Because if Johnson arrives on turn six, that still gives him f fully two turns to get into the battle. So in theory, Johnson could be ten squares down this road. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten here. And certainly be available for any kind of assault on the last turn of Culp's Hill or Cemetery Hill. That is not correct. Johnson's division was at the rear of the whole column of the Army of Northern Virginia and only reached this position around dusk and many maps show Johnson's division over here near Benner's Hill deployed but that was at nightfall. It was night by the time Johnson got there. So Johnson's arrival, maybe a nitpick, is a little too early. Again, um, it's a simple game um, but you can get the order of appearance right. And in tournament play, I mean, Johnson and Anderson are going to make one heck of a difference, especially when you consider the fact that the Confederate only has nine infantry counters, and two of them have suspicious um, order of appearances. By the way, the artillery, which is missing, of course, are the divisional artillery, and I'm supposing that the designer factored the divisional artillery into the Confederates. While he did not, for the Union artillery. So I, I sense a slight Union bias in the um, order of battle for the game. Now if it sounds uh, as if I don't like the game, that would be completely untrue. I do like the game very much. I think graphically it's very pleasing to the eye. I love the counters. They're very well done. And uh, it's got the nice order of appearance cards that I like so much. And uh, the board is half decent. And from time to time, there's been several articles in the General Magazine about this game. And the fandom of the game have come up with variant rules, trying to make it a little bit more um, up-to-date, making it more realistic. There's series replays. And um, this one fellow, Steve uh, Moans, has done a, um, a variant, Optional Rules for Gettysburg 88, that appeared in the General Magazine. And these appear to be half-decent rules, too. Um, one thing that is very wrong in the game is the stacking with the leaders. You're allowed to put uh, two divisions on the same square as long as you have the core leader with them. And uh, that's a little wonky also. This game, the scale is so large that it's perfectly acceptable to have no stacking at all. And I believe the basic game doesn't have stacking. Let me just check that first. No, checking the rule, even in the basic game, you are allowed to have two divisions in the same square as long as you have a leader counter on the same square. And um, in more advanced and optional rules, they make it that at least it's got to be of the same core. 
uh, in this example, Johnson and Anderson, a different course, could still stack on the same square um, as long as you've got AP Hill with them, which again is not too correct. The divisions should be of the same core in order to do that, but I believe that's an optional rule. So there's lots of little wee things that um, uh, veteran players have tweaked, and I believe WBC has introduced some things to make the game um, just more historical. Like I was mentioning, the General Magazine had variants for this game through the years, and one of them was this uh, East Calvary Battlefield variant. Now, I don't have the original uh, variant. I had to make a copy, and it didn't fit very well. But it went something like this. You could add um, the East Cavalry feel to it, and um, maybe it went like this. I'm not sure. This one doesn't fit very well, but there was a variant for having the Cavalry Battlefield, and that appeared in one of the issues of, uh, of the General Another anomaly I, about the map is actually not an anomaly to me. To me, the um, the board is crystal clear. I mean, I know that that's a hill, I know that that's a woods, and yet for some reason people have felt they had to do a PDF file um, showing which woods are connected to other woods and which ones are woods and which ones have roads and all that. Uh, Gentlemen, I, I don't know what the problem is with this game. It's very simple. I mean, that's a woods, and that's a woods. Someone was asking if uh, K8 is a woods, and I look at K8, and there's K8. Well, yeah, of course it's a woods. It's, it's got woods in it. But for some reason, people um, are having trouble with the train. For the life of me, I don't know why. This game is simple as the devil. I don't see any terrain um, anomalies. Um, I mean, you could nitpick. I mean, the road goes from there to there to there. Well, the railroad kind of goes from there to there to there to there. Holy cow, what difference does it make? Um, so I find there's some of the questions about this game I just don't think should be questions. But um, maybe it's just me. Don't know. Okay, summary on Gettysburg, the 125th Anniversary Edition. Do I like the game? Yes, I do. Is it my favorite game on the Battle of Gettysburg? No, it is most certainly not. Uh, it is division level, which is a little coarse grain for my tastes. It's a little bit too luck dependent. That's why it can't be my favorite game on the battle. I kind of put this game in the Greek tragedy kind of category. It's a simple game, I understand. That introductory, it achieved everything that the designer wanted to achieve, I'm sure. Where it falls down is, I find with just a little bit more tweaking, this could have been perhaps the definitive game on Gettysburg at the division level. There's just so many little silly things like the column movement um, and the combat system are just too simple. With the most minor tweaking, which people have done in, um, in their various articles in the general magazine, they've uh, actually made it into a pretty good simulation. Just that um, the rules are all over the place. You've got various uh, issues of the general with optional rules, articles that have been printed in other magazines. So it has not really come together. Now WBC has um, made their own little tweaks for the game too. Uh, I haven't looked at those closely. I should, since I'm going to be attending this summer. And I think I'd like to see some veteran players try this, see what they're coming up to, what they're doing. But um, the Devon and Gamble opening I find is critical for this game, as in most Gettysburg games. And your game won't necessarily go like history. Uh, the game is just too coarse-grained to allow that. But if you want a good introductory game on the Battle of Gettysburg to introduce new players, this is the one. Of course, it's now out of print, but there seems to be copies on eBay and around. It's not rare by any means. So um, that's it for Gettysburg, the 125th Anniversary Edition. Thank you for watching.